Yes, and we're live. A very warm welcome to you from Pakhuis de Zwijger. And welcome to an extra episode of Designing Cities for All. Of course, that's our two-year activity and research program in which we take a deep dive into designing products, spaces and systems for all. In response to the short film Planet City by Lee Myung that premiered this January, tonight we will talk about the strategies of degrowth of humanities and utopian design solutions for our cities, for all of which Lee Myung and our guests will be uh, responsible. Well, responsible for the scenarios. Liam, Liam will join us here uh, through Zoom and uh, I will introduce the guests here at live at the table in the studio a little bit later. But first, I have to mention that the film Planet City is still available to stream until April the 28th and that's via our website www.deswijger.nl. That's also where you can go if you would like to join in our conversation. If you go to the program page of this program, you can log into Zoom and there with the Q&A function you can ask some questions for the people that are here in the studio and for Liam Young, of course, as well. I will talk to Liam in a minute, but first I would like to introduce the panelists that are joining here, us here in the studio. A very warm welcome to Niasha Harper Michon. You're an activist, a purpose driven architect, and a business developer at Rao. A very warm welcome to you. Just in a couple of words, what's an activist? I'm happy to be here. An activist is an architect and an activist put together, let's say. So it's any uh, design or architecture industry professional that's going to, um, yeah, about change, trying to foster change in society within the work that we do and within the profession. Right. Uh, I'm sure that we will hear more about that in a minute. Arna Hendricks, you're a designer and an artistic researcher. Very warm welcome to you. You've been here before, so I've got the feeling that we know, we know each other. But tell me, what is the artistic researcher? What does that mean? Basically, it means that I take the freedom of an artist to investigate stuff I find interesting. <laughs> That's very broad. Is it also limited by anything? I'm an artist anything? that re behaves like a researcher. Right. You know, I don't really make things. I investigate things, and sometimes fragments of that investigation become, let's say, artistic work. Great. I will like to hear about that more later on as well. And my final guest is Edwin Gardner. You're a design researcher and co-founder of Monarch and the Corona Nauten. A warm welcome to you. We've got several kinds of researchers and you are a design researcher. What does that mean? Uh, well, <laughs> kind of an analog uh, to what Arne said. So not art, but more a kind of design as a... Yeah, that's basically my background, my craft. So that's my lens through which I look at the world and through which I research the world. So that's so basically I'm interested in the man-made world and how it got to be as it is. We're doing things wrong in the man-made world, aren't we? Enough, yes, <laughs> enough. <laughs> we'll talk about that later on as well. Then I would like to introduce to you Liam Young. He's a speculative architect and a world builder who operates in the spaces between design, fiction and futures. He's the co-founder of Tomorrow Thought, Tomorrow's Thoughts Today, uh, an urban future think, think tank exploring the local and global implications of new technologies. Liam, are you there? I guess... <laughs> a very warm welcome you to you and uh, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, you created the film Planet City and we're going to talk a little bit about that later on. Um, but let's start with a clip from uh, with a trailer from the film first. Let's see the trailer. Great, great. Yeah, that only was a very short clip to get a taste of the atmosphere of the film. 
again, you can see uh, the com complete film on the website and I urge you to see it as well. Liam, to start with you, um, you describe Pan Planet City as critical architecture, a speculative fiction grounded in statistic analysis, research and traditional knowledge. What does that mean? Well, I mean, Planet City is um, a very practical form of speculation in that it's a uh, a fiction, it, it kind of co-ops the language of, of, of science fiction um, and the mechanisms and infrastructure of Hollywood to produce it. But it's it's not a science fiction that includes a bunch of invented technologies. You know, it doesn't it doesn't have you know mythologies of supersonic travel. It doesn't have buildings that float on air because we've invented new material technologies. It hasn't solved the energy crisis with fusion reaction. All of the technologies that are in Planet City are already here. Um, they just lack the political will or cultural investment to roll them out at scale. Um, because really what we were trying to do with the project was talk about the idea that we're at a point really where climate change is no longer a technological problem, but rather it's an ideological problem that's grounded in political and cultural belief. Uh, the technologies to required to dig us out of the hole that we've created for ourselves uh, uh, already exist. Um, and people have been working on them for years and they're proven systems. But um, for various reasons, whether it be um, uh, you know, our cultural relationship to these systems or you know, embedded political funding systems, they, there's resistance. Um, and Planet City just just takes these systems and says, you know, what happens if we remove all those barriers and we we project them at, at scales that can deal with the the energy demands of ten billion people? What does that look like? Um, right. So yeah, it's very grounded speculation. Mm. In the film, um, you imagine a world where 10, mil 10 billion people live in a giant sustainable city and leaving the rest of Earth and the rest of nature to, to rest and to restore itself. Um, that's quite an imagination to have there. Can you tell us where that idea was born? Well, what we're, we're, we're trying to do is talk about really the idea that we're already living in a planetary city. Um, so it's, it's, it's not really an imagination, it's, it's just a way of creating a mirror for us to see the existing conditions that we're already in. The irony is, although, as you described, Planet City uh, you know, is uh, quite a provocative and, and almost absurd in its extreme pragmatism proposal, um, the real absurdity that's at the core of the project is business as normal, is, is our existing everyday urbanism. Because whether we realize it or not, we are all citizens of an existing planetary scale city. You know, every inch of the planet um, is somehow a product of that city. It's either produced by the city or it in turn produces the city. So really the project is trying to just create a headline or a you know, a, a, a very kind of evocative and provocative statement that is trying to draw us back into this idea and the reflection of who we are today. So, mm -hmm. you know, the irony of uh, so much great science fiction is that it's not really about some kind of projection. That's why I say it's a it's a fiction shaped like a city. It's not a proposal. I'm not I'm not suggesting we all pack our bags, get on a boat, and and head over to Planet City, but rather it's um, a way of looking back in on the world that we know in in new ways. Right. Um, you previously previously said um, the film is based in statistical analysis, research, and traditional knowledge. Can you tell us a little bit on how you got the information, where you got it from, and how you combined it into this scenario? Yeah, although I, you know, I'm the one kind of sitting here talking to you today, and and you know, I have my face in this little Zoom rectangle. Uh, <laughs> What we tried to do with the project was avoid all of design's typical approaches to, to issues of this scale. You know, I'm thinking of things like Bjarke Engels, Master Planet, and so on, where there's some singular architectural or, or design voice centering themselves in the conversation and um, solving the world's problems with the technology that they've either invented or co-opted. Um, that kind of techno solutionism, I think, is just repeating the the, the, the problems of colonialism. Um, Planet City emerged from, from a large cohort of, of 
collaborators around the world. Um, you know, we, we, but in my role is to curate uh, what I describe as a city council, which is just a, a group of scientists and technologists, folklorists, anthropologists, um, artists, writers, researchers from you know all over the world, and, and particularly focused on on locations and spaces that aren't normally part of these kind of conversations. Um, we have a huge range of huge range of collaborators from the global south. Um, uh, one of our key um, uh, kind of scientists was was from Brazil. Um, we have two science fiction authors from China. Um, we have a, a Canadian um, Caribbean author. Um, you know, we were just trying to curate this this really exciting group of people, and, and collectively we authored and, and imagined what this city could be and what it would look like. The diversity do, that, that, that you, you described is very important. Why is that the case? Why is diversity important in this sense? Well, I mean, when we're talking about a city for the entire population of the Earth, it's important to represent that Earth um, rather evenly, but, but more so, you know, I, I'm, I'm calling it here from LA outside my, my window this town produces visions like this um, as part of its business model. Typically, those visions are either, you know, cyberpunk dystopias um, with a, the journey of a singular white man, the hero's journey, kind of overthrowing some corporate um, uh, mega dystopia or some kind of government dictatorship, or it's like very sanitized utopian views of a future, again, kind of playing out kind of various forms of techno solutionism, um, where the city all kind of looks the same, um, these gleaming white and chromed tomorrow lands. What we were trying to do was to put into the world a, a, a counter narrative, a different kind of vision, one that is in a way aspirational, but at the same time, it's messy and complicated. It's culturally rich. Um, it's not sanitized. It's not uh, some dystopia ready to be um, overthrown. So we were just trying to, I guess, think about um, forms through which we normally talk about, talk through the future through um, and, and trying to create a different kind of story. Right. Um, if you talk about a dystopian view, um, uh, well, it's, it's a combination of utopian and dystopian in the sense that in the film, I personally missed almost the human scale. I mean, humans are not very important in the portrayal of the city as you portrayed it in the film right now. Or did I overlook something? Um, I mean, there's not crowds of 10 billion people. I mean, it's kind of a practical issue that, um, like, it, that there's a lot of extras to have to cast. Um, <laughs> and that would have, that would have probably blown our budget. But um, what we tried to do, and there's, there's a whole series of dances and, and um, characters that appear throughout the film, they're not given kind of speaking roles because we're, we're trying to capture the city in a moment of carnival or celebration. Um, one of our first um, acts in, in making the project was to, was to map on a calendar all of the cultural events, holidays, um, religious festivals, and so on. Um, and what we end up with when you collapse every cultural event on the on, on earth together is is a calendar that's dense with the, every day there's like five different things going on so in a way this city is one that's in perpetual celebration um so we tried to think about the city through this moment of festival a rolling 365 day long procession that snakes through its city changing its form depending on the neighborhood and the community that it's passing through. So the characters like you see on the screen right now um, are kind of they're, they're people that, that are working and living in the city um, that are wearing costumes designed um, by myself and, and Anne Crabtree, who is a costume designer on the project, trying to, I guess, express through costumery the sorts of cultural practices, traditions, crafts, acts of labor that, that, that exist within the city. So hopefully these people are visible to you. You can they, see them. They're, they are they're very visible, big but... on the screen right now. Um, <laughs> no, we, we, we're that's, showing that's them on the screen. That's how we're engaging with the citizens of the city. Right. No, no, we do see them, but we see individuals, which is very interesting, but how crowds and how systems of crowds or, or people work, that's something that I'm very curious of because of the film. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything about architecture that you discovered or about cities that you discovered while working on this film? 
yeah, I mean, it just ex- extraordinary redundancy, hmm. right? Like, like um, typically when we, again, when we talk about science fiction visions of the future, density is seen as being something that is uh, to be avoided, right? It's dirty, it's disgusting, um, uh, it's crowded. These are just extensions of, of sensibilities that emerged out of industrialization. Um, uh, but oftentimes the most vibrant and active parts of cities are the densest ones. Um, so what we're seeing is, is, is this um, culturally ingrained belief that somehow in order to have a human-centered uh, city for all, we need um, singular houses that we each own, a block of land with, with gardens at the front and the back and a little bit on the side, a uh, fence around it to defend itself and, and territory that we can kind of accrue possessions um, that signify who we are and what we aspire to be. And that's not the way that we can continue to make cities if we want to sustain some kind of human life like life on this planet. Um, uh, so just like, yeah, e- extraordinary redundancy. You know, if, if we can get if we can get Planet City working at the scale of 10 billion people, um, it's, again, that's not, I'm not trying to suggest that's what we do, but if but if those systems start to work at that scale, then there's literally nothing stopping us rolling it out at the scale of Amsterdam or Los Angeles or Melbourne. Mm. Um, so that's really the, the argument we're trying to make, I guess. Right. I, I think I interpret that as the, the importance of collectivity and not being that individu- individualistic anymore. Uh, to compare If you compare that to what, how we live now, and if we if we take that into account that we do not need our own houses or our own land, but we should live more collectively and to save nature and save the world in a, in a way. Am I correct in, in interpreting in that way? Yeah, I mean, I, I said that the beginnings of Planet City is the end of human-centered design, right? Like we've, we've had our moment, we've had uh, like a, a, the, 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 the period of which we were designing and making the cities based on our own kind of beliefs and desires. Normally when you talk about human-centered design, it conjures images of tree-lined streets and, you know, cafes spilling out onto the sidewalk and kids chasing balloons. Um, but really, you know, Planet City is just, sorry, human-centered design is just code for like, you know, organizing the world in our own image. Um, I'm much more interested now in Planet City, I think, I hope, is, is, is trying to be representative of um, you know, atmosphere-centered design or forest-centered design or whipping crane-centered design. Um, I think that's a kind of mindset that we need to start to align to. Right. Um, thank you so much for now. I'm going to switch over to the panel, but please join in the conversation. Um, Arne, I saw you nodding at the at a certain point when um, when you said uh, it's not a technological problem that we have to deal with. It's an ideological problem. Um, you know, the design that we have to deal with and the way we construct our cities. Um, why did you agree with that? Well, because I, I think... I mean, if you look at this city, this is basically this is is the ideology of growth. It is the the, the more, mm-hmm. the sort of concentration of uh, specialization of all these kind of modernist uh, ideas. So I, I agree completely that it's technology is never going to save us. It's always going to be something else. It's going to be our ideas. It's going to be so. I really connect to that idea of atmospheric design or or emotional design or, or designing from the perspective of other living beings because you know uh, technology is not going to be. It. There needs to be soul inside of the design. How can you get soul into, inside, inside of a design and how can you get people to understand that we need the phase after, you know, growth? Uh, well, that's, that's very complicated. But uh, let, let's, let's say that for sure we need to start practicing something mm-hmm. other than this techno-based thinking. And, and I, I th- like when I look at this film, I really feel that this is a, like a practicing arena for, for maybe something else, mm. maybe another type of understanding of the city. Uh, practice is something we don't do. We always come up with solutions, we always come up with smart new ideas, but we don't practice simple uh, different approaches to how we should live, how we work, how we engage with others. You know, so it, it starts with very simple things. I think we're all quite unknowledgeable in where this is going, where, where we are going as a species on this planet at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of pe- people probably pretending that they do. 
uh, but we don't, and we need to start practicing. Right. And, uh, and and art is one of the ways where somehow the rules are slightly different, and we can we can play with those rules, and we can we can practice. Uh, on a different basis, let's say, than what we are accustomed to or the paradigms that we've grown up with. Mm. It's very difficult, but you have to start somewhere. We do have to start somewhere. And Niasha, if I could ask you the question, um, um, Liam just stated architecture is, 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 is redundant in, in this scenario. Um, singular houses or territories, you know, we should get rid of that. As an activist, as an architect and an, and an activist, what's your position in regard to that idea, those, those ideas? Um, yeah, I think my understanding of the the idea of redundancy was just that there's a lot of the same. Mm. I don't know if I if I understand what you meant by that correctly. And yeah, I think in the end, if it's 10 billion people in one city, we have lots of things that are going to be very similar. There's going to be lots of repetition in a way. Um, so that's what I understand by the the idea of redundancy. Mm. And so then maybe it's about designing for this redundancy and thinking more in a smaller scale and how it can kind of be used for multiple applications as opposed to thinking, wow, 10 billion, this is so vast. But there's a lot of redundancy in it. That's how. But the thing is, if, if you research what people, at least in the Netherlands, want, it is that that house, that singular house with a little bit of garden. You know that that's makes that's their definition of, of what makes them happy. Um, should you just you know surpass that and design something else that's more collective and don't take their own ideas or ideological ideas in account about happy living? No, I don't think it's it's just about one or the other. I mean, a, a city is always a place of, of diversity in the sense where there's so many different things that people want, that people, because you might say people want a specific thing, but people want all sorts of different things. And it's just about providing a place where everyone can find their their happy place and designing for that mixity, for that uh, Diversity is, is, yeah, is the task of the designer, the urban, the urban designer. And the but architect. doesn't conflict with it, that with each other, you know, having your own place, but having the collectivity as well. I mean, it doesn't fit. <laughs> I think it's just about balance. There's always a bit of um, a bit of uh, yeah individual aspects or wanting something for your own and also wanting to share. I mean, we know that we are in a society where we also want to be together. We want to share. We want to uh, live together. And and because there's a lot of loneliness as well when it comes to just being too individualistic. Mm -hmm. So there's always this kind of balance that that you kind of have to play with and to find a happy middle right. to make it work. <laughs> Thank you for now, um, Edwin. The beginning of Planet City is the end of human-centered design. Is that something that you agree with? Should we stop you know, designing for humans or having, you know, our design being so human-centered? Um, well, I think it's a, it's a kind of par paradox in a way. So I think that the whole, of course, Planet City to somehow evacuate the whole planet and to live together on, let's say, a, a small piece of land in a super high density. Mm -hmm. So that's, so that's also, so let's say we are very human-centered. The past couple of hundred years since the start of modernity, like human-centeredness was born. Mm -hmm. And let's say life or let's nature or let's say uh, culture versus nature. So somehow humans place themselves outside of the rest of the world. So th the paradoxical thing I think is, and on the one hand, Planet City is that. It is super human-centered and then it leaves the rest of the planet uh, SB to rewild, etc. But I think it's also, in a way, it gives space to nature, which is very not human-centered, somehow mm -hmm. bio-centered. We've moved on to the, let's say, next paradigm where more forms of life can join the community than just the human species. And that's also, I think, uh, the kind of interesting paradox that somehow in our relationship, there's two ways forward. So either we kind of, let's say, go back or let's say become like completely organic, biological, total balance with the biosphere, mm -hmm. or uh, we disconnect. So we even make, let's say, for instance, if with the trends you now see in agriculture, so we do indoor farming or uh, we start to uh, use genetics and to, let's say, uh, kind of disconnect food production and, uh, and let's say a kind of way of dealing with life which is kind of disconnected from the biosphere in order to protect, let's say, the planetary biosphere. So it's not Is like that something one or that you other. endorse? Is that something that you believe in as well? Or should we always look for the balance? 
Well, I think both approaches can uh, work hand in hand. This, like the one that's not working is this open air factory, which we call farming work today. <laughs> that's basically a factory with no roof. It's, it is like, let's say, had less biodiversity than an actual factory probably. So it's yeah. kind of, uh, and that's kind of the mistake when we see a lot of our countryside that we see green space, but yeah, it's not, it's industrial space. Mm. And I think that somehow the, the middle that we know now doesn't work. We either have to go that way or that way and preferably combine it. They can exist side by side. Right. I'm very curious and the way Liam reacts to the responses that he heard. Liam, did, did you agree with our panel here or did you completely disagree? <laughs> Oh, of course, I, I, I agree. I'm a massive fans of, of everyone on the panel. Um, uh, I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I should kind of clarify a few things, I suppose. Like when I talk about redundancy, um, as described, like I'm, I'm not talking about, about architecture itself is redundant, but there's huge amounts of redundancy in architecture, right? Like, like just the idea that each of us have our own designated piece of green space that, that we can call our own you know, like if you consolidate that together into shared parks and shared spaces, um, that that is still kind of creating a provision for outdoor spaces, not to say that in, in, in the future, we, we all don't want to be able to wander around in a park, but or kick a ball around, but um, the redundancy of each kind of having our own version of it, the redundancy of each of us having our own kitchen, sitting right next to each other, the redundancy of each of us having our own um, microwave, our own electric drill, um, that we only use once every three months. Um, like these are huge kind of redundancies that, that lifestyles doesn't necessarily need to fundamentally change in order to be more efficient. Um, uh, that's one thing I would note. Um, and the other is, is yeah, that, that, that again, I just want to be clear that the that, that planet city is in a proposition um, in the sense that it's, it's, it's trying to um, project itself as another kind of solution, but rather it's it's a stage through which we can actually have a conversation around the necessary lifestyle changes that might be required in order to continue human life. So um, it's 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 full of complexity and contradiction um, and irony, as, as as Edwin described. But um, I really love um, Anne's point about um, uh, practice. You know, like like in in our case, film is a site in which to prototype ideas um, about about cultural practices um, and through that film we kind of live live them in a way um, science fiction is a form of teleportation we can prototype various scenarios and responses and what that kind of looks like and and that we practice through the the craft of making film or the book um, I, I I really love that um, way of describing I guess forms of speculation um, as forms of practice and, and the necessity of that kind of practice in, right. in, in engaging with these issues. Speculation and speculative design is, of course, very important. But what good does that, that do, do us? Why? What can we get out of speculative design? Is it only nice? Is it only fun to imagine what could be? Or should it be more practical and should more people listen to it? What, what's your opinion about that, Liam? Uh, I mean, the, the future is a verb, not a noun, right? Like, like the future isn't something that just brushes over us like water. We all play active roles in shaping and defining those futures. And I guess um, uh, I hope a project like this one um, can be a part of creating a shared discourse through which we can collectively kind of think about what kind of futures we all want to be living in rather than just stumbling into them um, or, or being sold them, um, being sold the futures that are most convenient um, uh, to those that can profit most from it. Um, so it's, it's, it's really about trying to engage an audience um, in, in, this, in this kind of conversation. So it's not just people uh, at a table like this one you know, having these sort of verified conversations and screaming into the void at the various museums and galleries that speculative design projects seem to tour, um, but rather it's trying to create forms through storytelling that um, wider audiences can start to get caught up in and develop an emotional response to, be that positive or negative. Some people run screaming from any vision of Planet City. Um, this is a horrible, disgusting dystopia. How could you? It looks like Blade Runner. Fuck off. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Um, but the same film gets a totally different reaction depending on your own ideology and, and worldview. Um, right. If we talk about that discourse and if we talk about starting up a conversation, who should have a seat at the table and how should we organise it to get it off this table and into the world? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of at the core of our own practice. And, and part of the reason I'm, I'm here in Los Angeles is that, that we kind of co-opt the mediums of popular culture uh, to, to have these conversations. When I'm not doing something like Planet City, I'm here you know, doing production design and, and world building for, for Hollywood. You know, I, I think like kind of embedding sort of Trojan horses inside these mediums of popular culture is 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 really interesting and and valuable because fiction is this extraordinary shared language you know like i mean i'm trained as an architect which means i'm trained in the sorts of diagramming of urban systems um, mapping plans and sections but these are extraordinarily coded languages you know that, that i trained for five like seven years to to learn how to kind of produce and read and understand but ever since we can sit up where, where we fall asleep being read a story, we, we watch we watch films, um, it's how our culture shares and disseminates ideas. So if as architects and designers, we're serious about um, the work that we do and we value the ideas that we try and put into the world, uh, I, see, I see value in, in coding those ideas into stories. And Planet City is a story. Right. Really, it's a fiction. It's a fiction. Maybe parts of it become could become reality. Niasha, how, can you tell us how does speculative design play a role in the work that you do? Um, yeah, I think speculative design is important in the sense where, um, well, in Liam's film, it's really about yeah having this using fiction as like social commentary for what's going on now and using the future as a way to get the conversation going. Um, in the work that we do at at Rao, we're also thinking about a new world order, so one where circular economy is the way that things uh, work. And since that's not the reality today, the work that we do is always kind of thinking ahead and and trying to facilitate this future that doesn't exist now and making buildings that will be a part of that future mm. within the world of today. So who's interested in that at the moment? Because it's not a very common thing to say, but who's interested in that? Well, I think it's it's an important thing for if you think about like in long term sort of a way of thinking. So not just in now. Um, it's it's the only way uh, to to think about the future and think about future generations. And there's a lot of value in it as well. So working with circularity means that. Um, you can disassemble and reassemble the parts of a building, for example. So you make a building and you can disassemble it and rebuild it somewhere else. And so the actual value of a building is no longer just something that's in one place. And if you want to change, you might have to demolish, which, mm. you know, you pay someone to come and demolish. Whereas in the case of uh, demounting and remounting somewhere else, you might actually get paid to take this building, to take the materials away and, and for it to become something else. So it's not only good for the planet, let's say it's also good for your wallet. Again, that's a great scenario. It, it hasn't been put in practice yet. Hopefully it will be. But again, who's interested in that scenario? Well, lots of uh, different owners for if you have, if you want to invest in a building, you're going to be investing in much more if you're thinking in circular, uh, with a circular mindset. So it's very interesting financially, but it's also interesting uh, for the environment, let's say. So there's a lot of interest. It's growing. There's maybe less uh, understanding. So it's also about you know, kind of hand-holding and, and making sure that it's a, a way, um, something that we can all do together and mm. that, you know, you can kind of understand. Um, but I think even with this sort of using fiction or at least using uh, good ways to communicate what you want to say is really important because stories are a good way of getting over a message that may be a bit too far away for some people to, to understand. So it's also... You can also put them into practice. You can put ideas into practice because of the storytelling and because of speculative design. Uh, Edwin and Arne, you both collaborated 10 years ago uh, on a specul speculative design project uh, called 8 Billion People. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, well, it was actually called 8 Billion City, but Billion, it doesn't Billion matter. City, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It was, um, yeah, it's a project that, uh, well, it, it, it has a very similar, uh, let's say, starting point as Planet City. Mm -hmm. And it started, uh, I think, yeah, Arna and me were both in Tokyo on a workshop. 
and we were kind of yeah, overwhelmed with this, this infinite it interior that Tokyo is and still, let's say, uh, the biggest city or let, let's say the big, biggest single urban agglomeration on the planet where, yeah, and of course, uh, well, also in Liam's film, but of course in many science fiction films, especially around the cyberpunk genre are, of course, have their key uh, inspiration from Tokyo. And that's, um, I think we were fascinated by okay, how uh, how can how can you live in this infinite interior in this city that seems endless? How does it work? So th I think that was a kind of question we were walking around with, like how does it work to live in a completely artificial totality? Right. So if if we don't see an outside, if we cannot, and that's also you can see that in Planet City and many cyberpunk images as well, it has this top and bottom. But there, where is the sky? Where is the horizon? It is kind of an interior, right. and that's kind let's of. Let's have a look because we've got some images of mm -hmm. eight billion city, and let's have a look. And maybe Arne, uh, during the, the watching the images, where you can elaborate on what we see. Uh, let's have a look. I'm going to watch the film. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. We see a map of the world, we see lights coming up, and, but we also see something there that's glowing, which is not on a continent. Now, basically what you're looking at is people slowly moving towards the 8 billion city. So uh, what happened with me personally, and I have a slightly personally, slightly different relationship to the 8 billion city. I mean, we are not one person. And we are basically really different also in our approaches. But uh, for me, it, it, it was about concentration. It was about pulling back. It was about sort of giving back to nature uh, what was, uh, you know, what was taken from it somehow. So maybe almost like a romantic idea. It, 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 it's sort of materialized from from thinking about how can we be less damaging or something mm -hmm. in the in the in the beginning um, but i noticed that my sort of uh, creative makeup was not really ready for really designing the city itself like, like for instance what liam has done you know i cannot do mm. that but i did become very interested in the movement of the people mm. i became very interested in in what would happen during the process like who who gets to the city first who gets later i think the best design we made for the city was a pie chart in the end <laughs> where china has the biggest chunk or something you know yeah. it wasn't very original but it was fun but, but um, what's interesting as well is that on the map that we see now is that um the, you've got a, a dot that you know is, is uh, that we're focusing on yeah and that's supposed to be atlantis well it's it you know in a way you shouldn't even be say that but saying that but it, it's in the middle of the ocean because we didn't want this this city to be in a in a place that anybody could have a claim to mm. we wanted everybody to come there as a fresh citizen in a way so it was part of the idealism of this place where we all start anew we have another chance um, still, of course, then you run into the problem. Uh, it, it, you know, a person from the Netherlands uh, catches a plane uh, with his passport is immediately there. Uh, you know, maybe somebody that lives in, in the jungle of uh, northeast uh, Congo mm -hmm. uh, has more trouble getting there. So already, you know, so that's why I became more interested in the, this movement of the people. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how can and, and this is just a reflection of that specific uh, response to it. And I think that's also the... Let's say the whole 8 billion city, how it got started was, yeah, it's a provocation. So we thought, okay, what happens? What if we propose this? Mm. So it, it's kind of you make an extreme proposition and from this proposition, all these crazy new problems arise. Yeah. And that's interesting because if you kind of deal with the world as is, it's messy, it's complex, it has power, it has money, etc. And if you somehow make this extreme position, which is kind of obviously outside of normal reality, you can kind of investigate these questions, uh, let's say, without directly entering into all these messy discussions with, no, that's not possible, that's no, no, we're making a, like a speculative 
research project. So you you kind of place it outside of in a special realm. Exactly. Yeah. Which, so which is a lot of people really what they forget when they think about speculation uh, when, when speculative design is really about the now. There's a discrepancy between the image that is created and the now, and the difference is what the project is about. So but, you're but looking again, at a speculation. But again, if you talk about speculative design, this ha this happened ten years ago. Yeah. If you look back, what 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 did it give you, except for the pie chart? <laughs> what, well, you know, what what was the outcome that either surprised you the most, or that you know was most important, or was it considered to be a discovery? Um, I mean, um, basically for me, the, the, the outcome was that, um, uh, you know, it, I, I, w I really like what you said about repetition, for instance. Uh, you know this song by Prince, Joy in Repetition? I don't know if you know it, but he has this song. This song, every time I think of 8 Billion City, this song pops into my mind. There's joy in repetition. How to enjoy, let's say, the sense of repetition was an outcome. I cannot say I had a big sort of, oh, this is the epitome, now I know. It was really about all these. Uh, when you do artistic research, you find fragments of mm -hmm. a world and you, you cherish them. Sometimes they turn into a bigger fragment. This was it. it it's just a fragmented sort of memory. But in that sense, were you, in the end, interested in really realizing an eight billion you know, city? Oh, evidently not, because otherwise, you know, we would have continued with it. For me, it really became about how do people get there? I mean, uh, yeah, and it turned again, okay, into, but, but it turned into evacuation. Well. But, and why weren't you interested? Why wasn't it interesting to have everybody, you know, coming collective to no, the, the, this the, the thought is, is, is interesting. You know, I love this idea of, of all of us being in the same space and then somebody says, let's all jump up in the air and everybody in the world jumps up in the air. I mean, I like the fantasy of it, but the moment it gets walls and streets, mm -hmm. it loses for me that freedom of, uh, of sort of provocative thinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if this, this makes any sense, but I'm always thinking of that, that concert that Rod Stewart gave in 1994. He gave a concert on Copacabana Beach in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it's a legendary concert because between four and five million people came to see him on that beach, making it the best visited concert ever in time. And, uh, and so between four and five million people came and I was thinking, wow, if he would have given that concert in 10,000 before Christ, he would have had the entire world population right there in front of him. And the rest of the world would already have been empty. There was a moment when this emptiness existed. Yeah. Right? And so that is an interesting thing. He would have had everybody right there if he would have given that. But would you touch, touch on just something? Just the idea of everybody being in one right. point is beautiful. But you touched on something interesting as well, is that we are with about 7 billion people at the moment. Um, your scenario almost was about... Eight, 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 almost eight, Your scenario was about eight. The, the scenario that Liam uh, described is about uh, 10 billion people. Right. Um, but isn't it also important to degrow humanity, to have less of us? Aleem, what's your position about that? Uh, yeah, I mean the, and, and Arnie can speak to this much better than, than I can. He's been, his, his life project has been about degrowing humanity in a way. Um, uh, we, we chose the number 10 billion because it's a projected, you know, it, it's now universalized um, in futures speak as the, as the number that we reach in 2050. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's certainly... A whole bunch of projects. Basically, every every uh, Hollywood film has has this supervillain, which is trying to wipe out half the world's population to trying to to, to save us. Um, <laughs> that's the kind of the supervillain du jour right now. Right? Like, <laughs> there's certainly a bunch of projects about um, uh, limiting who we are. You know, limiting population. Planet City isn't that project. It, it's mm. saying, okay, well, if we are going to reach 10 billion people, what could that look like? Um, right. Uh, there's different kinds of speculations, and, and I, I'd love to. Uh, it's, it's been it's been a number of years since I've um, swum through the shrinking man. Um, I would love to hear Arnie's response to um, eight billion or, or eight eight billion tiny people um, and and degrowing humanity in in his terms. Right, Edwin, what's your position towards degrowing, and what steps should be taken in order to realize degrowing? Um. What's my position on degrowing? <laughs> well, act, well, I think in a way, I mean, the the evacuation or ten billion city is also degrowing. So it's, yeah, I mean, you can like literally shrink, you can literally kill people, but you can also retreat. Mm. You know, and I think that's um, so our footprint on the planet. Yeah, that's also a kind of degrowth. And it's not, and I also think this kind of uh, degrowth, um, so we also have to kind of untangle it from uh, that, that it's connected to 
per se to back to the land, to a kind of backwards move, that degrowth is actually, you can connect it to uh, regeneration, to also to abundance. So there's a connection between, so it's not either or, it's mm -hmm. I think you both do at the same time. So if you make space, uh, abundance return. So if you leave the land, it becomes rich and abundant. Mm. Uh, and I think that's somehow we've, we've set ourselves up in a system that uh, depletes. We grow and grow and mm. we deplete. So it's an, an, it's an opposite. So we, we grow abundant, mm -hmm. but a kind of abundance that uh, like uh, leaves our planet barren. Right. And by and by retreating, that. by retreating, you stimulate abundance in that sense. Yeah, yeah concentration is definitely a way of degrowth. Concentrating but, but in that in, case, yeah. in that sense, the world, you know, the world's population is is, is expected to all, almost all live in cities. So you, is that a good development in that sense? In principle, <laughs> depends how we do that. So if we are all gonna have, let's say, a very clean uh, roundup uh, lawns, yeah, maybe that's not the good kind of city. So I think there's many ways to be a city. Mm. So yeah. right. Um, I know the, the Planet City is a provocation. It's about ideas. But uh, Liam, can you tell us, is there anything practical that we could um, apply in our cities right now? Is there something about infrastructure? Is there anything that, that, that you discovered that we could, you know, uh, try to implement now? Yeah, I mean, like, the city in, in its form works um, as an extraordinarily concentrated form of urbanism, right? Like, like I think it's true that, like, the you know, majority of us live in cities. The city that we live in doesn't just exist in the footprint of that of that city, right? Like, what, again, the, the pro prompt for Planet City was to say that the cities we all live in have actually terraformed the entirety of the Earth, that in order to do a map of Amsterdam, you can't just draw a circle around the urban environment that we all think and know of as Amsterdam. You need to also draw a map around the, the mining landscape, the agricultural landscape. Um, you know, it, it's a distributed map. You, at, uh, Amsterdam is atomized across the entirety of the earth. To really understand Amsterdam, you have to include all of its contingent landscapes. Um, what Planet City does is that everything to produce, contain, and maintain that city exists on the footprint of the city itself. Um, so we, one of our uh, co collaborators was um, Kenneth Nielsen, who's a, a, a scientist, a bi microbiologist working with NASA, JPL, who's developing the closed loop systems um, that would uh, work on uh, uh, Mars settlement. You know, like, like again, like everything that is produced by that community, um, the waste, food, everything exists within that bubble. Um, our first question was, could this work for 10 billion people? His answer was, uh, well, it's a modular system. You just need a lot of modules. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it, it can happen in a form. Um, Planet City is entirely powered by renewables. Um, one of the criticisms leveled at those, at, at those systems is they're not consistent. So you need massive battery infrastructure to, to run them. Um, but there's an amazing group of scientists in Australia developing a system of, of what we call pumped hydro storage, which basically means um, at areas of, of peak energy production, like when the sun's shining and the wind's blowing, you, you funnel excess energy into um, pumps that pump water into high altitude holding lakes. And then at um, periods of peak energy demand or when the sun isn't shining, you, you just kind of release the tap and, and the, the water flows down. You, you store um, this energy, not in, in stacks of rare earth and lithium, but you store energy in the potential energy of high level water um, in lakes um, and Planet City Canal systems and, and you know, it's high altitude holding lakes are, are literally the batteries of the city. They've done extraordinary research where they've built an algorithm that um, maps the entire topography of the planet and have identified, I think it's something like 6,000 potential sites for um, pumped hydro uh, energy storage. And I think in order to, to for the world to shift to, um, to entirely renewables, I think you need 30 sites or something like that, like some ridiculously small number, but they've mapped 6,000 with their algorithm. Um, and I can keep on going on, um, but, but it's just to say that, that again, all of these solutions um, to carbon sequestration, carbon production, energy production, food production, 
um, already are, are existing in plain sight. Um, but uh, for various reasons, um, uh, we're resistant to them. Um, right. And Planet City is just to try to explore what it means to embrace them. Uh, thank you so much, Liam. Niasha, is there any link that you see uh, with the work that you do in, in, you know, to put things in practice? Um, yeah, I think that one of the the things is is just the fact that it's so um, like compressed in the sense where everything is all in one place. I think just the reduction of of, of what you need, so really minimizing the the footprint and minimizing the needs, minimizing um, yeah the the energy needed, all that kind of thing is is important. And um, in the way it 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 kind of sums up. Uh, yeah, what what you need? You need to sort of come down, but then also have have more experience or have more life in what you do have. So mm. minimize, but also maximize other things, which is what you were saying. Can you tell earlier. us a little bit about the City Resilience Index and, and the sidewalk laps? Because I think that's very in line of what we heard. Yeah, so we'll do separate things. I guess I can start with the Sidewalk Labs in Toronto, which is by, um, well, by Sidewalk Labs. And they were, they're an alphabet company, so also Google. Um, and uh, it's not going to happen in the end because of coronavirus, the economic situation stopped this plan but it was a very innovative plan um, to kind of have this high-tech community uh, so overlapping the technology aspect of things but with the urban an urban plan so it was really forward thinking in that way I mean you had public Wi-Fi a lot of affordable timber homes but also um, yeah, I think the streets were going to be illuminated in different ways depending on the situation um, but what I think it also sort of is interesting to think about is who sort of decides what the city will be like. And what's interesting in Planet City is that it's it's speculative and it's was done with a lot of different people, a diverse group, and it's kind of free because it's it's not a real project. When you have these kinds of real urban plans, who gets to decide how things are? And in this case, you have um, sort of this uh, corporations who... Um, yeah, exert a certain power on on the democracy, or let's say, or governance of a city, and get to decide what it's going to be like. And it's a very interesting thing. It happens a lot with lots of these larger um, corporations. So it's also something to think about. That even when you think of the future of the city, how does it work um, in terms of governance, in terms mm -hmm. of who has a say? And and yeah, I think it's an important thing to think about. Not only the design or what it will be like in terms of how many people will be there, but who gets to really design it or who gets to think about how it should be right. and manage and monitor it. <laughs> right. And can I add something? Of course. Like what I th think is also also like with the image you now see with the, of sidewalk labs, but also like the, the kind of sort of the instruments of imagination Lim Young is using, which is kind of like the Hollywood machine, let's say. There is, of course, um, not everybody can afford you know, the, the, the tools of imagination or the tools of this kind of imagination. But what I think is interesting and what's also a bit in Planet City and you see in the dancers is a kind of this solar punk mm -hmm. aesthetic. And which I think is what's inter very interesting of solar punk, it is, it's almost like a, a fan-based movement. So it's a lot of fan culture and it goes from people who make drawings, who design cities, who kind of make kind of these uh, costumes. And it happens on Tumblr, on blogs, on all kinds of places on the internet. And it's, so it's very interesting that somehow a completely new science fiction imaginary emerged out of a kind of fan culture and not out of, let's say, a giant machine with, which can produce a lot of production value. So I think, and it's get very interesting when you see this kind of bottom-up groups uh, like able to kind of present these imaginaries and to bring them into the, the public domain. Mm. But isn't that still also limited to a select group of people who can afford that, who can afford no, the I fantasy mean, they of make solar it. punk? They are the makers of but, it. But to create it, you need, you need some basic No, you need create. skills. Yeah, exactly. Yes, but uh, so that's why this fan culture is so interesting. It's like uh, there's zero money. Uh -huh. They're producing it because they are. It, it's driven by a kind of sentiment or desire to but see a kind of different future. But are those skills accessible for everybody? That's what I wonder. Well, 
Niasha, what's, what's your idea well, about that? Well, I mean, in a sense, it's true that we, even if you think of technology and um, sort of the smart city, you could argue it's it's somewhat irrelevant for a large uh, part of, of, of the global population who isn't thinking about the future city, but is thinking about getting to the present city of, of that uh, other people are living in. So there's also um, this sort of uh, balance, which I think in degrowth, there's also that thought of bringing uh, like the resources, using them more effectively or being more fair and more just and having a certain sense of equity because it's not just, oh, there's some people who can kind of dream about the future and there are some people who, who just aren't at that level today. Can't which is, afford it yet. Yeah, they can't afford to dream about or speculate in the way that we can, which mm. we have to be very aware of and, and to think about how we can include them in the discussion. Is dreaming future. about the future a privilege that you can? have I, I believe so why so, and it's but it's it's a privilege but I think it's important to know it and then to to understand that and then to use that um, to think about how you can sort of I guess share that privilege or or to to give other people that opportunity as well and to not just think that everyone has this same opportunity that, that you do because of where we are born in the world or, or those sorts of things so it's important to be aware of as a designer for yeah. sure We've entered the final stage of our conversation. And I would like to close off with a quick fire round because uh, because of time restraints. Um, what is the key element that are, that is vital for the design of a city for all, for an inclusive city? Can I start with you, Niasha? Sure. Um, so I would have to say, on the one hand, I guess, minimizing, let's say minimize your footprint. But then I would say also sharing and community. There's this aspect of coming together. Mm. Um, so not just physical things together, but also in the interrelational aspect of things. And then um, adaptability and flexibility. So in the sense of dismantle, reassemble. I would wish, let's say, that we could make the world today and we could disassemble all the buildings and we'd reassemble hmm. them in the 10 billion uh, city. And so we really have to think about the future in a flexible way and uh, shared and more compact. Thank you so much. <laughs> Arna, can I give the same quick fire challenge to you? Oof. What's the key element in designing cities for all? I guess important how you manage the collective fantasy. I think you already touched upon it when you're talking about future. Um, if a certain group of people has the privilege of, of you know, uh, Im imagining that future, then a certain group of people is probably not imagined. Mm. And that's this perpetuating uh, situation, you know, where because the future is very powerful in, in what it actually produces. Mm. It does produce truth and reality. And so I think, uh, yeah, how to manage it and to be so aware, uh, as you said, uh, uh, that, that you need to uh, do that in a, in a, in a sort of, uh, yeah, non-hierarchical way or something. Right. I mean, for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Edwin. Oh, I can just add uh, to this uh, string. So I think, yeah, before anything uh, is done or acted, it is imagined. So uh, fact follows fiction. But I think it's important that those who are not heard or those that are not adding to the imagination of a city uh, are giving the op given the opportunities to add to the imaginary of that city and their, their voices are heard and they can add to that. And that's something we have to do proactively. Just mm. making it equal is not enough. We have to like raise the stage for those who cannot add their voice or their imagination to the, to the fray. And that's human and non-humans as well? All the more, the merrier, I'd say. <laughs> Very good. Liam, can I give the final quick challenge, quick, quick fire challenge word to you? What's the key element for you to design cities for all? Uh, I, mean, I think the key element is that it's it's not a quick fire question. Um, <laughs> uh, that there isn't there isn't one answer. There isn't one important most important thing. Um, uh, the the answer is complexity and and um, creating platforms for the coexistence of of all forms of difference. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it, by very definition, it, it's not something that can be answered in a quick fire challenge because that's its its very essence. Um, is that there are no easy solutions. Um, uh, whatever futures we're going to be creating, it, it, they're going to be really hard. Um, and they're going to require huge amounts of sacrifice and struggle. Um, and we've shown absolutely zero inclination um, for uh, or willingness for those kind of sacrifices right now. Um, I mean, one, one of the things I, I want to also add is, is that, that 
a lot of your questions are framing some of these things as choices, you know, but we don't choose to, to live in a city like this. We choose to have a house with a garden. Um, they're not choices we can make, you know. Um, it's not a choice. Something like Planet City or the movements we're talking about or, or some of the quick fire solutions that people are talking about, these aren't options. Um, these are these are absolute necessities if we if we are at all interested in the survival of our species. Um, uh, we've, we've gone beyond the point of being able to choose. Um, uh, we now just have to act in some form or another, or just um, uh, you know throw our hands in the air and say, "Ah, oh, fuck it, well, <laughs> uh, let's just let's just let's just drive this train to the ground." Hmm. Uh, you're completely correct. <laughs> and on that note, um, just to, to, to repeat what you said, I completely agree. The answer is complexity and there are no easy solutions. Um, of course, this is only a start of the conversation and not the final answer in order to save the world and go to from this very complex world to a very simple solution. So that's not the, 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 the aim. But the aim is to start a conversation and that should happen on more platforms and bigger platforms as well. And to close off, to, to, to repeat what you just said, that these are not options, they are necessities in order to, you know, be able to live here in this world uh, uh, for a longer period of time than we're heading to right now. Thank you so much, Liam. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for sharing your stories. And thanks again for the film Planet City. And thanks for joining us. Thanks for all the amazing panelists. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to hear you talk and, and thanks for being involved. Great. And hopefully we'll see each other in Amsterdam in real life when that's possible again. That leaves a couple of things that I need to share with the audience as well. The, like I said, the online screening on Pla of Planet City can, uh, can be watched on uh, www.desweiger.nl uh, and that can be, the film can be watched until April the 28th. Um, the Planet City book, because there is a book that we haven't talked about, but it's very interesting, with a lot of essays, a lot of facts as well, and a lot of figures too. Uh, it can be bought, in, in, at least in Amsterdam via Atheneum, and there you can get a discount code with with the with the this the, you can get a discount with the code DCFA um, to twenty one twenty two and then you get a ten percent discount at other name which is worth it. Um, episode nine of this Desi uh, designing cities for all will be on March the third and the title will be design from inclusion and it will, will focus on products and services and it will be with Marie Driesen van Driesen and Ruth Toro. This is the end of the program. If you would like to contribute uh, to our programs in these difficult times, that is more than welcome. You can leave a financial contribution that benefits the programs directly, and you can do that on the website, desweger.nl slash pay, and there every contribution that you give will benefit the programs directly. Well, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for all our guests. Thank you for sharing your insights, and hopefully we'll see each other soon next time. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>